Good day, everyone. It is time for us to get started with our monthly webinar here at CWNP. And the topic this month is wireless clients, the real story. And we'll see why it's named such as we go through the presentation today. Our basic agenda is to, first of all, define a wireless LAN client. We'll talk about the fundamental components that make up a client. And then we'll talk about some general client categories. What types of clients do we actually see? And we'll look at some performance factors related to these clients. What, what is it that helps us to understand the performance we're going to get out of our wireless network? And finally, we'll talk about some client information sources. So we'll look at five specific sources that we can use to get information about our clients. In addition to the fact that we can do some protocol analysis on our own if we want to capture information in probe requests and probe response frames, these kinds of things that can tell us a bit about a client's capabilities. And so we will be uh, looking at five different sources to get information outside of having to do those kinds of captures ourselves. If you don't know me, I'm Tom Carpenter, and I'm the CTO here at CWNP. And we're in the process right now also, in addition to this webinar, of getting ready for our annual Wi-Fi Trek conference. It's going to be in Orlando this year. And just so you know, it's October the 8th through the 10th for the pre-conference training. We'll be having a CWNA, CWDP, CWSP, and CWAP class there. The CWNA class will be the brand new CWNA 107 that will be launching just before the conference. Then the actual conference itself will be from October the 11th to the 13th. And that will be a multi-topic, multi-presenter format three-day conference there. You can get more information about the conference by going to cwnp.com and click on the conference banner. You can also email trek at cwnp.com for any conference questions that you might have. So make sure you look into that if you are looking for something to attend in the last quarter of this year related to Wi-Fi. This would be a great event for you. Now let's get into our agenda for the day today. So first of all, we're talking about defining a wireless LAN client. And to help with this, I just went and selected a particular client, and we're going to look more at the details about this client later on. This happens to be a USB adapter that could be used with a laptop or desktop computer. It is an 802.11ac Wave 2 adapter, if you want to use that terminology. I call it optional feature adapter because in the standard there's no wave one and wave two there are simply required features and optional features and what we actually see is what's commonly called wave one for 802.11ac is the required features and what's commonly called wave two is the optional features and you can actually see that in the 802.11ac amendment or the 802.11.2016 rollup of the standard. So I grabbed this from an FCC ID search. It's a picture of the inside of an Alpha AWUS 1900 adapter. And I picked this adapter for a couple of reasons. One reason is, again, it is an 802.11ac Wave 2 adapter. But the other reason is because this adapter happens to work with a couple of protocol analyzers. So, for example, you can use this with ComView for Wi-Fi, and you can use it with Air Magnet Wi-Fi Analyzer Pro from NetScout. So uh, both of those support this adapter now. And we'll talk a little bit more about the chipset that it's based on and things like that later on in this presentation. But inside, of course, there's a printed circuit board. And then we have four antenna connectors. And you'll notice that the FCC folks decided to label it chain 0, chain 1, and chain 2. And then there's one that's aux antenna. Well, the basic concept of this device is it is a four antenna device but it is a three stream device. So it only supports three spatial streams. And therefore, even though you'll see four antennas sticking out of it, you cannot from that also conclude that it is a four stream device. And that's the case with this adapter. So this is a three by three by three adapter. It does support multi-user MIMO if it's in the right environment to be able to take advantage of that. And so what we see then is that to have a wireless adapter or a wireless client, you need really two fundamental things. You need the chipset, and this happens to be a real tech chipset, and we'll talk more about that later. You need the antennas, and the antenna chain includes, of course, the links to the antennas and the antennas themselves. 
And then you need some kind of system interface, an interface by which it connects to the system. So this one happens to be a USB interface. It could be PCI Express, PCI in a desktop, or some other kind of onboard interface. So the point is that you need the chipset, the antenna, the system interface, and then there are other components too. There are filters that are used on these types of clients and so on, but we're focusing primarily on the things that give you the features, though it is important to know that filters can impact things like the sensitivity because they can add noise. They can also help differentiate between noise and a signal. So they can definitely add extra capabilities as far as the potential capability of a device to receive a particular data rate at a particular signal strength. But they do not necessarily add features such as having a multi-user MIMO capability or 160 megahertz versus 80 megahertz channels and those kinds of things. So the, the main things that give you the features are the chipsets, the antennas, the system interface of course is just required. And so this is effectively what a wireless LAN client is. And this is true even if it's not a USB client like we're looking at here. So it could be a laptop computer that has a mini PCI Express or half mini PCI Express adapter inside of it that actually gives it its wireless capabilities. And many laptops that you take apart, you can actually see the uh, mini PCI Express adapter that can be removed. You can see the antenna connectors on it and you can even follow them to where the antennas go, whether they're in the back of the laptop or in the screen of the laptop or what have you. And then with your tablets and mobile phones, you'll often have either a mini PCI Express adapter or something of that sort or an onboard chipset that's going to give you the wireless capabilities. And this is the basic component set then that makes up a client, whether it's integrated into one overall system board that's being used by that client, or if it's a separate ad adapter that's added onto the system board in order to get the capability, or as in this case, through USB two or three. And we'll talk specifically a little bit about USB adapters later because we need to understand some of the issues, of course, surrounding the use of them. Now, then we have to ask the question, though, why do clients even matter before we get into the different kinds of clients and so forth that we have available to us? The thing to keep in mind is that vendors focus heavily on the APs and their features. Uh, for example, they may say, we have an 802.11ac optional feature capable AP for you, which is a Wave 2 AP, right? They're going to say it's a Wave 2 AP. I'm telling you that that means it's the optional features, such as 160 megahertz channel. That's optional for 802.11ac. 80 megahertz is required by 802.11ac. And that's why Wave 1 supported up to 80 megahertz. Then Wave 2 took that on up to 160 megahertz. Multi-user MIMO, optional. Uh, but not required. So wave one didn't have it, wave two does, etc. So the vendors will say, this is what your AP can do. Well, let me just be very direct. Four stream APs do not matter if the highest client is a three stream 802.11ac mandatory feature wave one client, for example. Okay, so you might say, hey, I've got an AP that can do multi-user MIMO, it can do four streams, it can do at 160 megahertz channels and etc. Well, well, that's nice, but if the maximum capable client you have is only three stream and doesn't support multi-user MIMO, you can't actually take advantage of any of those features the AP has. So we have kind of an example here at the bottom of the slide to help bring this home. So I've got here a Cisco 2800 series AP, which happens to be a four by four by three AP. So it does have four, uh, antenna chains, but it is a three stream device. Okay. So read the specs close when you're looking at APs because the Cisco 2800 series AP at one point has a sentence in the specs that says something like it's a four antenna AP capable of three streams. So if you don't finish reading that statement, you don't see that it's only capable of three streams, even though it is a four by four. So this nomenclature we use four transmit by four receive and then the colon, after that, we see how many streams it supports. So the max data rate then based on a 160 megahertz channel would be 2,340 megabits per second. Uh, it is multi-user MIMO capable, has a flexible radio. What that means is that you can run two 5 gigahertz instead of a 2.4 into 5 gigahertz. So you can do dual 5 gigahertz in a single box. Uh, it has four DBI 2.4 gigahertz antennas. 
and 6 DBI 5 GHz antennas, which is a nice thing to see some of the AP vendors doing, giving a little more gain on the 5 GHz antennas, given that uh, RF signals from 5 GHz APs are more difficult to receive at a signal strength that gives you the SNR to get the higher data rates from the same distance as 2.4. So that's kind of a nice thing to see being done there. So this is the 2800 series AP, and let's say that's what we've deployed in our environment. But let's say the, the best device we actually have we're using on our network is we have a bunch of Lenovo Yoga 910s. Okay, and I'm just using this as an example. It could be any number of devices. This happens to be a 2x2x2802.11ac device. It uses the Qualcomm QCA6174 chipset. Because it's a two-stream device and only supports an 80 megahertz channel, it is a max of 866.7. So this is an interesting chipset. It does support multi-user MIMO, but if you look at the actual specifications, you'll see that the channel support is up to 80 megahertz. So therefore, we can't use a 160 megahertz channel. Now, I'm, I'm even putting 160 megahertz in here because it's in the standard and it is capable. Uh, APs are capable of it. Clients may be capable of it and so forth. But hopefully, you're not going to be using any 160 megahertz channels in your enterprise deployments. You might see a few scenarios where you use 80 megahertz, but mostly it's going to be 20 and 40 megahertz channels. So what I'm looking at here is an even really real world for what you would see. Now, the antenna gain on the Yoga 910, uh, in my research, I couldn't find any information on that to help me there. So I've simply said the antenna gain is unknown. So we'll assume it's 2, 3 dBi, somewhere around there, but it's unknown. Now, that's part of the puzzle. The, already we see that we're down to a max data rate of 866.7. So it does not matter that the 2800 series AP can do a data rate up to 2340 because I don't have a client that can get anywhere close to that. My best client is a two stream client with only an 80 megahertz channel, even if I was in some alternate universe where I was using a 160 megahertz channel. Okay. So the end result then is that that's a best case scenario, but my Yoga 910s are going to be spread out throughout the facility, aren't they? They're not all going to be right up close to the access point within a few feet of it or something. Uh, so let's say we're about 50 feet away and our noise floor is tolerable, it's not really bad, then the actual link's probably going to be somewhere between 520 and 650 megabits per second. So either 520 or 585 or 650 megabits per second. Those are the three data rates just under the 256 QAM data rates. So if you don't have a good enough SNR to do 256 quadrature amplitude modulation, then you're going to drop back to 64 quadrature amplitude modulation. And the highest that you get with 64 QAM is 650 megabits per second when you've got a two stream device in an 80 megahertz channel. All of that, by the way, you can see in the standards. It's in 802.11.2016. It's in the 802.11 AC amendment. So you can see that information in the tables there. Therefore, the real world has already come down from 2340 to 650. So the fact that the AP spec sheet says, hey, we've got 2340, and I'm really only doing 650, tells me one important thing. And it's the last sentence in the bullet points here. Real wireless LAN performance is driven by clients and client locations. So the reality is, and we're just talking about one client, we're not even beginning to introduce what some people call good data or through data or throughput. We're just talking about raw data rates at the 802.11 level. And so even just talking about that, we see already that we've lost basically 75%, almost 75% of our data rate going from 2340 down to, let's say, the average of 585 megabits per second. Therefore, what we can see from this is that barring a few tweaks and changes we might be able to make with our APs and our design, in other words, we could put more APs so there's less space between the APs and the clients to try to bring the data rates of the clients up higher. Yeah, we can do that but only within some bounds of reason because we can't over-engineer to the point where our co-channel interference is so high now that it didn't give us any benefit anyway. So therefore, I stick to this statement, real wireless LAN performance is driven by clients and client locations more than by the power of the AP because most of the time 
we'll end up with APs that are way more powerful than our clients. Now, I know there are all those exceptions. You know, there are those hotels that are still running 802.11G. I get that. And in that case, the client's not the constraint. It's actually the AP that is the constraint. But we're talking about more of business type deployments and not so much hospitality here. And in those type of enterprise deployments, quite often you find yourself in this very kind of scenario. And again, this doesn't even factor in the reality that you're going to have mobile phones that are single stream, tablets that are single stream, some laptops that are single stream and that you're not going to be using 80 megahertz channels. You're probably going to be using either 40 or 20 megahertz channels and 5 gigahertz and certainly only 20 megahertz and 2.4, right? None of you are using 40 megahertz and 2.4, right? Okay, so the point is that we are just not going to see the data rates close to the potential of the AP. And understand that even though there are two radios in this 2800 series AP and they can both be put on 5 gigahertz, it doesn't change anything we're talking about here because each of them will create a separate cell, a basic service area, if you will, a BSS that's part of an ESS. So they'll create these separate cells, but in the cell is what we're talking about for our potential. And that data rate, the 2340 megabits per second, is about the cell. And so the reality is that if we could, in some magical world, have both radios at 160 megahertz, and we had a three stream client connected, and they were at the highest data rate, then sure, we could pump through these kinds of data rates theoretically. But it's only theoretical because the real world doesn't see clients like that. This is why clients matter. Now, I've spent a lot of time here because this is probably the most important overall thing to take away from this presentation today, other than maybe where you go to get information about what your client's capabilities actually are, which we'll also talk about later on. So this is very important information. And remember, you've got to extrapolate this out beyond just the one Yoga 910 and take it further to really understand the performance because you might have eight of these Yoga 910s connected to an AP while they're also four iPhones, three Android phones, two iPads, two Android tablets, and three other laptops, as well as maybe something like a, a few door locks or something. So the point is, you're going to have several other devices that are also connected to the AP, and they're going to use up airtime. So when it comes to actual throughput, your throughput's going to be way lower for the cell than this 585 or 650 megabits per second. So let's talk about the general categories then. So we said we'd talk about general categories of clients. And the first category is what we might call stationary. These are wireless desktops, right? And other devices that are stationary. They do not move about. With these devices, for the most part, we're looking at the location of the Wi-Fi antennas to make sure they're in a good place for good signals. So for example, if you have a tower-based desktop and it uses a PCI adapter, for wireless and the antenna is sticking out of the back of the desktop and then you put that desktop down on the floor and push it back underneath of your desk then you've got several attenuation factors there you've got the case in the way from the front you've got your wall panels that separate the cubicle or possibly a full wall behind it around it etc it's also low to the floor where the ap's are probably on the ceiling so there are several different factors that come into play here that make it so that the antenna location can become an issue in relation to your signal strength for those desktops. So that's probably the biggest issue there that you have to think about other than just making sure that you have a wireless adapter that's compatible with your operating system and gives you the potential for the throughput that you need. And of course you can easily get 11AC PCI adapters that are three stream. So those are very commonly available that can be put into a desktop. But keep in mind that most desktops, like this all-in-one that we see here, that have Wi-Fi already built into them are rarely three-stream. They're more often two-stream. And so that is a factor to keep in mind if you're just using some kind of built-in Wi-Fi that is in the desktop. Then we have laptop devices. Now I'll put this in the general category of mobile. So stationary, your desktops, they don't move around. Laptop devices are mobile, meaning that we do move around with them. And we don't necessarily walk down the halls of our facility with the, the laptop screen open and using the laptop while we walk. Yes, some people do. Most people look at those people and think they're weird. And the only exception to that is you're not weird if you're walking around with that laptop open because you're doing a site survey. Then you're a very skilled technical professional with high potential for opportunity in this life. 
But seriously speaking, though, we don't usually, as end users, walk around with our laptop open. So it's a mobile device, but it's not necessarily the next category we'll talk about, which is highly mobile. But when we are talking about laptop devices, again, you've got to know what they have in them. PCI Express, uh, Half Mini, Mini PCI Express are the common adapter types that are in them. There are others as well that we're seeing come on the scene now, uh, possibly some type of other integrated onboard chipset, depending on the kind of laptop that it is. And in addition to just knowing the adapter's capabilities, it's important to understand with laptops the operating system that's running because that's going to drive the actual supplicant capabilities that you have. So a Chromebook with the Chrome OS versus a MacBook with Mac OS versus Windows or maybe even Linux in some scenarios. So you need to know what is supported. A good example of that is that with the Surface Pro, when you first get it out of the box, it doesn't support the enterprise EAP types necessarily that are supported on the same version of Windows just running on a laptop computer. And you have to download an extra update from Microsoft to get the support for those extra EAP types. And so it's useful to do that research, understand your devices, and know what support issues you might face when implementing them. Now when it comes to laptop devices, we often use USB adapters. Now, of course, these can be used with desktops as well, so I'm not ruling that out. They certainly can and, and quite often are. But we use them a lot with laptops in our industry because we use them for protocol analysis and things of that sort. And I don't have the ones pictured here for any particular reason other than I had image shots of them already. But I will say that the Edimax AC1750 on the left does work with ComView for Wi-Fi. And it also, I believe, works with Air Magnet Wi-Fi Analyzer Pro. You'll need to double check that, but I'm pretty sure that it works with it as well. And then you've got the Proxim adapter on the right, which has been a common one over the years for site surveys and things of that sort. Uh, the point is, USB devices come in two primary versions today. USB 2 and USB 3. And some of you may have seen a video that I put on YouTube a couple of weeks ago that's very important in relation to this. So USB 3 devices have an extra interference element introduced that is very important to understand because they actually use a signaling method, a spread spectrum signaling method that operates across the 2.4 gigahertz band. And that leaks right out of your adapters, your USB cables, USB hubs, uh, and all of these things. And so it's very important to understand that when you're using a USB 3 adapter, you're probably going to lose anywhere from 6 or 7 through to 20 or more dB of SNR. That's signal to noise ratio right at the point of the adapter. Now, the adapter, I mean, look at this AC1750. The antenna is right there, right? Right by the adapter. So it's going to be right by the adapter where that USB 3 interference is introduced. So understand there will be some issues with interference there that can impact the potential data rates you can get and so forth, because data rates are driven by SNR, not signal strength. What do I mean by that? So I, I might take a device and detect that the signal strength one centimeter from your adapter without that adapter that's USB 3 being powered on is, let's say, something really good like NEG 48 dBm or something like that. And I say, oh, great, you'll definitely be able to do the highest data rates. But if when that adapter is fired up, it's introducing 15, 16 dB of interference, you're not going to necessarily get those great data rates that you think you're going to get, are you? Now, of course, it's in 2.4 gigahertz. We don't see the same interference in 5 gigahertz with it. But if you want to see the video on that, it's in the CWMP TV YouTube channel. And sometime probably next week or the week after, I'll be posting another video going a little more in depth about it and talking about some other things and showing it in some other tools to help you see some additional issues with USB 3 interference. So make sure you understand that when you're using these adapters. I do know that Air Magnet Wi-Fi Analyzer Pro has implemented a feature where if you plug in a USB 3 adapter that it supports, it actually asks you if you want to use it in USB 2 mode. And I have used a spectrum analyzer and looked at it in USB 3 mode and then looked at it in USB 2 mode and it makes a massive difference on the interference that it causes. So that's a nice feature that they've introduced there. Hopefully we'll see some other protocol analyzers help us out in that way too. But uh, that feature is there in uh, NetScout or Air Magnet Wi-Fi Analyzer Pro. 
Then we have, of course, our tablets and mobile phones. So these are what I would call highly mobile because we do walk around with our tablets in our hand using them. We walk around with our phones on phone calls or tweeting, Facebooking, sending emails, using Slack, whatever it happens to be that we're doing on our phone, right? So we can walk around while we're still using these applications and so forth. So they are highly mobile and therefore it becomes very important to understand the capabilities of these clients when we're designing our wireless network, particularly things like their receive sensitivity ratings for getting the different data rates. So we can make sure that we're getting the signal coverage that we need so that they can accomplish the data rates that they require. So it's important to keep that in mind with these highly mobile devices. And often they have the wireless integrated into the circuit board. They're using, in some cases, chipsets like Snapdragon chipsets that actually have Wi-Fi as well as the main CPU of the device built into it. And so everything's kind of bundled in one. And then, of course, they're going to have their antenna connectors and the antennas are going to be located somewhere in the device. The best way to find out where the actual antennas are in these kinds of highly mobile devices, by the way, is to do an FCC ID search, which I'll talk about here momentarily. And uh, so because they often point out in the internal photos of those devices where the antennas are actually located on the devices. So if you care, you want to know where they're at, then that's a good way to do it. Don't take your phone apart, okay? Just go to the FCC ID search page and find it based on the FCC ID there. Now then there are also specialty devices and I just have a couple pictured here. We've got an ID badge which can double as a push to talk device and a door lock. Okay, so both of these are 802.11 wireless devices. The door lock happens to be a 2.4 gigahertz only device, which is an important thing to consider when you're looking at the device pool that you have. You have to make sure you understand the devices that are on 2.4 gigahertz, and there are lots of them in lots of companies, and some of them are not a laptop, a desktop, a mobile phone, or a tablet. It's something like this door lock or a video camera or something like that that we can't stop using, and no one is interested in investing in upgrades to 5 gigahertz capable devices. So 2.4 gigahertz still has to be implemented as best we can to support these kinds of devices that are out there. Thankfully, devices like door locks like this, they send some of them as little as two or three kilobytes a day. They don't really send a whole lot of information back and forth on the wireless network, but they are there and they do force protection mechanisms to kick in. And those kinds of issues are just very real. And I've seen some of these that are being sold, literally inventoried on shelves right now, that are not only 2.4 gigahertz, but they're just 11G. They're not even 11N. And and so that's very important to keep in mind when looking at specialty devices. So by specialty devices, that's that category of wireless devices that's not necessarily a normal device you think of as a user using with Wi-Fi to browse the internet, to use applications and things like that. But more they're dedicated to voice, video, or they're very specialty devices like garage door openers and door locks. So these are all out there and important to consider. One final note, when looking at your laptops particularly, I'm starting to use a new term, and that is multi-band. So instead of saying single band versus dual band, I'm saying single band versus multi-band. And the reason is because we're seeing devices now come on the scene that are not dual band, they're true tri-band, not the untrue tri-band. The untrue tri-band are the APs and, and wireless routers, particularly wireless routers that are sold in the consumer space, and they're called tri-band, but they're really only dual band. They have two 5 gigahertz radios in them and one 2.4. I'm sorry, but that's not tri-band. That is dual band. Tri-band would be like this Acer laptop right here, which works in 2.4, 5, and 60 gigahertz with 802.11 AD. And so this is a perfect example, real world device that is a multi-band device. And it's important to understand that we're going to see more of these, particularly in laptops, coming into the space over the years. And this is why I've started adopting the term multi-band instead of dual band. Even if I'm talking about a dual band device, I'll often say it's multi-band, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. And so the, the issue here then is as we begin to see more use cases for 802.11 AD and things of that sort, maybe even 802.11 AH, right? As we see more potential use cases for this, then it's going to be important to understand that we'll have to consider those other bands as well when it comes to our client devices. And finally, before we get into our sources of information, an important thing for all of the devices is understanding the supported security options. So 
there are devices out there that support no enterprise methods. So they do not support 802.1 XEP at all. They only support pre-shared key. And with those devices, if you must use them, then you must have an SSID that supports pre-shared key. It's really that simple. Um, it does make roaming easier, right? But the point is that it's important to understand that some devices may not support 802.1 XEP, and that can be a big deciding factor when you're purchasing the devices. So keep that in mind. So if you have the option to buy devices and pick the right one from the start, then if one is available that supports enterprise security, make sure you get that. Even if you're going to use it with WPA2 Personal today, you could still have the feature capability there so you could use WPA2 Enterprise later if you actually need it. So it's very, very important to understand what the supported security options are. All right, now let's talk about then the sources of client information. And there are five different sources that I'm not just going to talk to you about, but I'm going to show them to you that are available here. We have vendor specifications. There's a site called Wikidevi, which is very useful. We have FCC ID searches, chipset specification, and Mike Albano makes a nice resource available, clients.mikealbano.com, and we need to help him with that. So let's take a look at these sources. So here, first of all, we're going back to that adapter we saw an internal shot of earlier. This is the Alpha AWS 1900. And so here you do see a picture of it with the antennas connected, what it looks like, that kind of thing. Um, and this is the first source of information. So what do we have for information? Well, we generally have some kind of a spec sheet, like the one that we have right here. Okay, so this is letting me know the output power. If I'm doing 802.11 AC, the output power is 20.5 dBm. 802.11a or n in 5 gigahertz, 19.5. And then in 2.4, uh, 802.11n, 23. 802.11g, 20. 802.11b, 23. And then if I'm using just 802.11a, not a n, then I have 21 dBm. So it's telling me the output power. I can also see my receive sensitivity. So if I want to do 802.11ac, I need neg 84. 802.11n, neg 90, 802.11g, neg 70, 802.11b, neg 84, and 802.11a, neg 72. So I can see my sensitivity ratings. I can see my data rates. Max is out at 1300 megabits per second, it says here. We can see that it also, from a security perspective, does support a WPA with 802.1x. So that tells me we're going to support WPA2 enterprise and personal. We don't really care about WPA anymore, do we? We're not using it, right? It's deprecated. We're not using it. Well, I wish we could say that. We still some, see some people using it because they have old devices they need it. But hopefully I can say we're not using WEP anymore, even though it's supported here. You'll notice that there are four external detachable dual band antennas. So they're antennas that are shared by 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Of course, being a client, it only works with one band at a time. And then the channel width is 20, 40, or 80 megahertz that we see right here as well. And you can also see the operating systems that are supported being Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So we've got some specifications here. It's letting you know what this device is capable of. You can always go to vendor sites. Let me rephrase that. You can often go to vendor sites and get this kind of information. With clients, sometimes all you ever see with a laptop, for example, is it's 802.11ac. And you don't necessarily even see any other details. Was it one stream, two stream, three stream? Does it support 80 megahertz, 160 megahertz channels? Does it support multi-user MIMO? So often that information is not even provided when it comes to a laptop or even sadly a tablet or mobile phone. But that's where you might need to go a little bit deeper. So this is the vendor. Now if we go to Wikidevi, we can see here the page for the Alpha Network AWS 1900. And we're going to see a little bit more information here as well. So we can see the Linux driver that's available. And look, it reveals something to us. It reveals the chipset. So the chipset is RTL 8814AU, which is something that wasn't revealed directly in the vendor specifications. So we do have that here, which means we could potentially do some research on the chipset to find out what that chipset is actually capable of. So that's something that's interesting that's revealed to us here on this page. And you can also see down here, by the way, other adapters that use this exact same chipset. So if you know that, for example, Linux supports this chipset and you can do capture with uh, this chipset in Linux, then you can look at any of these adapters as possible solutions for you. So you can see 
that we have several different adapters, the Alpha that we're looking at, an ASUS adapter, one from Aki. We have the D-Link DWA192, which is listed as supported now by Air Magnet Wi-Fi Analyzer Pro and ComView for Wi-Fi. We have the Edimax EW7833 UAC, which is uh, supported also by the protocol analyzers that I just mentioned. A Netgear, a TP-Link, and a TrendNet. So these all use that same basic chipset. And you can see they are all USB 3, and that's important to keep in mind. Now if we go to the Realtek website, we can take a look at this particular chipset, the RTL8814AU. And here we're actually seeing it is an AC ABGN adapter. And it is a single chip that supports three stream 11AC solutions with MIMO and Wireless LAN USB interface controller. The Wireless LAN MAC and a 4 transmit, 4 receive, 3 spatial stream baseband and an RF single chip gives us these capabilities. You'll notice down here it's telling us it's 4x4, four 4, 3 spatial streams. So that's what the chipset can do. Now it's possible someone could implement this chipset and do less with it, but that's what the chipset is capable of. And you can often dig in and get more information about the chipset as well. Another source that we mentioned is the FCC ID search. So this is the FCC ID search for that exact same adapter, the Alpha AWUS 1900. And a few things you can see here. First of all, there will be a test report. So you can see what the results were as far as uh, signal power output, things of that sort. And you can see external and internal photos. So if we click on external photo and wait for that to load, we will hopefully see the photo eventually. So this does take a while to load. It's not this long, but it does take a while to load sometimes. And here we go. It's trying to pull it up now. There it is. So here you can actually see the adapter with the antennas disconnected and the USB 3 cable that comes with it. They always use rulers to show you the size of things and give you perspective. And so this is the bottom view and the side view and another side view and just the antennas by themselves as well. So those are the external shots. Well, that's always interesting, but you can see that when you take it out of the box, right? The thing that's exciting to me is the internal photos that keep me from having to take a device apart. So here you see the device taken apart with the top cover and the bottom cover, the printed circuit board with the antenna connectors on it. Here you're seeing that shot we saw earlier in the presentation. The only thing I added to it was the chipset, so we could see where that's located. And here you see the bottom view of it. And here you see the chipset zoomed in, so you can see right there, RTL8814AU is that onboard chipset. And there's other circuitry as well that is here for various features and capabilities. Point is, the FCC search can give you some good information. And one thing to keep in mind is if you can't find information about what the chipset is, but the FCC search shows internal photos, then quite often there'll be one zoom close enough you can actually read the chipset model right off of it. And so you can pull that information from that source to get information about what the device actually has the capability of doing. The final one I wanted to show you before we go to Q&A is clients.michaelbano.com. And so uh, the first thing I'll point out is right up here at the top of the page, there's a how to contribute section. I'll not go to that right now, but it lets you know what kind of capture you need to do in order to send to him so he can provide information about the device. We see several devices already in here, several devices from Amazon, Apple, Asus. Uh, we see the Centrino wireless adapter. We can see Dell devices, the Edimax adapter, the AC1200. Uh, various other Intel adapters that are supported, iMacs, iPads, iPhones, a lot of information here. And what you're seeing across here, just to go to the top, these are the 5 gigahertz channels, and Y means they're supported and no means they're not, or N means they're not. Uh, SS is how many spatial streams does it support? What level of dot .11 is it? Is it N, AC, etc.? Does it support multi-user MIMO, yes or no? What's the maximum transmit? Is 802.11v and w there? And then there will often be little notes here too that might be of interest to you. So it's an excellent site that gives you some information about some common wireless clients that might be out there. Always a great place to check to see if there's already information provided about the client of interest to you.
So we've seen then the vendor specifications, Wikidevi, chipset specifications, FCC ID search, and clients.mikealbano.com. These are good sources of information about various client devices. Now that's the information that we're scheduled to cover today, so we'll begin the Q&A period for those that have the time to stay for that.